Thank you all for coming um, here tonight. Um, you can see that my project is about the relevance of anti-angiogenic therapeutics in the treatment of uveal melanoma. So don't worry if that sounds complicated. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be explaining things as I go along and you can ask questions at the end. I'll also talk a little bit about the process by which I completed this project and I'll do a quick evaluation at the end. So the, my inspiration for this project started when I was reading a biological sciences review article about the process of angiogenesis. And if you don't know, angiogenesis is the process by which the body proliferates new blood vessels from pre-existing blood vessels. And it was this box which particularly caught my eye in the article because um, in this box, Dr. Herbert, who's the writer, he talks about the concept of anti-angiogenics and how it can be a weapon uh, against cancer. And the, the principle is that if we cut the blood supply to a tumour, which is a cancerous mass, we can stop it obtaining the essential nutrients it needs for growth and, more importantly, stop it from spreading to other parts of the body. This is known as metastasis. And when I read this, I was astonished that um, I hadn't heard about this because it sounded like it could be a revolutionary treatment. So I wanted to find out more. So when I put my application in, I was quite uh, excited. You can see I had really declarative <laughs> titles like paralyzing tumors. And, but I didn't really know anything about this topic because it's not something we cover at school. So it was going to be a major research task. So this was my first title, quite broad, just very general, and my supervisor immediately said that you won't be able to write this in 5,000 words, it's simply too big, so you should streamline your focus. So when I went home, I had to kind of think about what type of cancer I wanted to research, because anti-angiogenics has different results for different cancers. And I came across this interesting source which talked about the discovery of the process of angiogenesis by this guy, Dr. Falkman. And he did experiments on rabbit eyes, and I was quite curious to find out what that was all about. So I kept the theme of ophthalmology in my, uh, in my project, and I decided to do my project on uveal melanoma, which is the most common type of eye cancer. And I quickly settled on how relevant are the therapeutics in the treatment of uveal melanoma, because I felt that this kind of gave me a better evaluative slant. So later on, when I found out the truth behind the anti-angiogenics, um, it helped me a lot. So these are the five major areas of the project, and I'll just briefly talk in turn about each part. So. This is what I alluded to earlier about the rabbit eyes experiment. And to prove that angiogenesis occurs, and particularly how tumours uh, are able to manipulate this process, Falkman, what he did, he got um, an eye cancer and he implanted it in both eyes of a rabbit. In one eye, he put the cancer in a space called the aqueous humour. This is just a fluid filled space of the eye where there's not many blood vessels. And the sec in the second eye, he put the tumour next to the iris. Now the iris has a good blood supply, there's lots of blood vessels. And we can see after he left it for a couple of weeks that the one in the aqueous humour, we can't see it, it hasn't grown at all. But the one in the iris has grown loads. And you can see all the blood vessels. And this is confirmed by this graph. The red line being the growth of the tumour in the iris, but the one in the aqueous humour kind of flatlines. And this is because, this can be explained by the existence of these blood vessels, which have allowed the tumour to obtain essential nutrients it needs for growth. So this kind of shows how important angiogenesis is for growth. Later on, the um, Falkman found out that um, uh, there, there was a specific pro-angiogenic factor, which is like a small substance which is released by the tumour, and this is called vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, or VEGF. And you can see the action of VEGF in this slide. Um, when VEGF is um, kind of released, it causes 
the blood vessels to grow towards the source. Um, so this is a, um, dividing rapidly behind it so it grows towards it. VEGF is usually expressed by our body cells when um, there's a region of hypoxia, which means low oxygen concentration. And this is quite important when we consider how the tumor blood vessels are different to our blood vessels. So our blood vessels are nice and regular, but the tumor ones are kind of a lot highly disorganized. And they're also leaky, as you can see with these red arrows. And sometimes there's even backflow of blood. So this means not much oxygen is being delivered to the tumor cells, um, which kind of increases this issue of hypoxia. And then I had to consider about um, uveal melanoma itself, so eye cancer. And this is the most common treatment for eye cancer. It's called brachytherapy. And it's a type of radiotherapy. <laughs> and basically, you put this metal disc into the patient's eye in, in a surgery and has the, these radioactive substances which kill the tumor cells. And this is a remarkably effective way for treating uveal melanoma. It's about 95% effective. But the problem is, is that in 63% of the cases, um, the patient would develop something called radiation retinopathy, which is seen here. So in this diagram, just can't really see it that great, but um, this is a uveal melanoma. It's been treated with brachytherapy. You can see it's kind of shrunk down. It's being controlled. We have this yellow band, and that's called radiation retinopathy. And this occurs because uh, the radiation damages the retina itself, which is part of the eye. And this can cause blood vessels pr to proliferate. Um, it, this is called retinal neovascularization. And this is where anti-angiogenics come in, because if we can stop the EGF from being expressed, we can stop these blood vessels being proliferated and stop the symptoms of radiation retinopathy, which is arguably a lot worse than the cancer itself, because it can lead to a severe loss in eyesight. Now, we're just going to touch briefly on the metastatic disease. So this is when the disease spreads to other part of the body. Um, so most of the time, the melanoma was spread to the liver, but unfortunately, the metastatic disease is still uh, a fatal disease, and life expectancy is only about a couple of months after diagnosis. And, and unfortunately, antiangiogenics don't work uh, on this condition, as we're going to explain later. But there are some radical ideas where they can isolate the liver and bathe it in some solution but nothing tangible has come of use. And then I put in this section about genetics after I started my research because I think it's quite relevant in the 21st century where there's lots of genomic analysis and they're obsessed with analyzing the DNA and seeing whether there's any specific mutations. And this diagram is called, has something called the hallmarks of cancer. These are some of the common mutations which occur and it gives cancer its characteristic traits. So you can see how it like, gains the ability to metastasize, and you can see angiogenesis is one of um, the, the characteristics of cancer. And don't worry too much about the detail of this, this slide, but this just shows some of the mutations which are common to uveal melanoma, and how some mutations cause it to become more dangerous. That's on the right, so it more, has a greater ability to spread other parts of the body and some mutations make it less dangerous and this includes things like the shape so these ones are more elongated versus those rounded ones so you can see there's many different layers of things which affect the behavior of uveal melanoma so now we're going to come on to limitations of anti-angiogenics and most of them are most of these treatments are something called monoclonal antibodies and Basically what these do, they attach to a cancer cell or a specific receptor and they attract our own immune system to come deal with the issue, to kill the cell. But the main issue is that the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor, uh, which is what the antibodies target, they're also expressed in our body cells as well as the tumor cells. So this means you can sometimes get some unwanted side effects, such as like, hemorrhage and clotting, but 
the main downfall is summed up perfectly in this diagram. So you can see this is a uveal melanoma, and after one injection with a Avastin uh, drug, you can see it's grown in size. And you know, it's, it's quite a shame, but it can be explained by something called the pseudo-hypoxic phenomenon, which is basically as follows. So when you cut the blood supply to a tumour, the issue of hypoxia, so low oxygen concentration, increases because it's getting less oxygen. And this kind of acts as, as a selection pressure and selects for more dangerous cancer cells. Cancer cells which don't need a blood supply to grow and don't need a blood supply to metastasize. And this has even been shown in test tube reactions that if you just have some melanoma cells and then you put some avastin in, bizarrely it increases VEGF expression, even though, as I've said before, um, anti-angiogenics are supposed to inhibit the EGF uh, expression. So the main conclusion is that um, yes, anti-angiogenics form a major part of the treatment of uveal melanoma because it treats the main complication that is radiation retinopathy, but they can't, they're not standalone drugs, they can't work independently to treat uveal melanoma. And um, yeah, it, it's quite a shame one of the reasons could be that if we go back to this slide on the characteristics of cancer is that angiogenesis is kind of the fifth mutation. So it's like maybe we're treating a symptom instead of the root cause of the cancer. But in my opinion, I think there's still hope for this type of treatment because it's such a long biochemical pathway and we've only really kind of scratched the surface in the research into this process. I mean. Most of the therapies revolve around uh, this drug, which is Avastin, and this targets this receptor. But there are many different drugs, which potential drugs we haven't explored, and there are constantly new radical ideas coming up. So potentially in the future, if we put more energy and research into this, there could be, uh, in the future, a viable way to treat uveal melanoma with anti-angiogenic drugs. So now, quickly going to skim over some of the sources I use. So I use quite a few um, and here it is a selection. So these two which I just highlighted, NCBI and JSTOR, they kind of form the cornerstone of my research because they're large databases full of scientific papers and yeah it really helped with the specific details and numbers that I needed. We also have some like patient foundation uh, websites which were good for basic clinical information and treatment options because they're set up for patients. There are YouTube and there's this software by a company called Amgen and that was really, they had good videos just to give me a base understanding. So when I was doing all my research at the start, that was quite an important resource. And I also, oh right, <laughs> here's a couple of books I used. And I, I also emailed some people, so this guy was the person who wrote that article which sparked my interest. I just wrote to them and they just gave a couple of links just so to further my re uh, research. So evaluation, successes. So I think I was able to stick to deadlines well. I finished my first draft by the end of the summer holidays. I, was, I used a wide variety of sources which helped um, make it balanced. <laughs> and Dr. Fortner helped me with developing my scientific essay technique, particularly with the referencing style and stuff. Um, and little things like putting things in italics. And hopefully that will help me when I pursue my medical degree um, because I anticipate writing a lot of scientific essays. Some of the challenges were that some of the sources were clearly a lot above my level. So interpreting them was difficult. And you can see that in the project breakdown, there's lots of like discrete parts of the project. So linking them all together was a bit of a challenge. So I've learned, yes, touched on this. Time management, specif specifically doing everything early on, before school started, really helped so I could get it done. And I had to be flexible in that once I found out the limitations of anti-angiogenics, I had to kind of change the orientation of my project. So 
I had to change my views. Any questions? first of all because you picked an incredibly difficult topic and the level of scientific detail required um, was really quite challenging there's certainly no overlap between anything that you study in um, your A-level sciences um, so well done and, and certainly you know when we had a little think about the presentation tonight you know you realised that you needed to explain it quite clearly and I think I think everyone would agree that mm -hmm. you did that you know, exceptionally well, so, so well done for that. Um, I, just a bit, one uh, question from, from me, um, I mean obviously you started off with quite a great deal of excitement about this, this process and you, you had hoped that it was going to be yeah. um, successful, um, clearly as you said you had to adjust your opinion on that. Um, Although you, you stuck with the, the sort of the eye cancer, the uveal melanoma, did you find any other particular cancers where it, it is successful? Yeah. Or is it really something that... It is still in its infancy, successful. particularly with uh, treating cancer, but I actually prepared this additional slide because this is a question I was thinking about. So yeah, there was like... The record I didn't know about this. <laughs> there was a... Um, yeah, so kidney cancer and... Um, <laughs> colorectal cancers are the most common types of cancers which is they're useful but they're also used for something called prostate artery embolization so this is like a new treatment to treat enlarged prostates where they put synthetic beads to stop the blood flow to um, the prostate gland and then this is something which actually sprung up from my volunteering and it's you often used to treat age-related macular degeneration which quite a lot of old people actually suffer from in the care home I volunteer at. And this is an anti-VEGF, so anti-angiogenic drug. And this person's actually, her eyes were deteriorating like her mother, but after putting these injections, um, it kind of arrested the deterioration so she could continue driving, which is quite important in her life. So there are other comp uh, applications which are not linked to cancer um, for these drugs. Yep. Um, I'm not sure if you explained this, but um, why does it work for some types of cancer and not for others? Or do you not know this? Yeah, I, I don't really know. I mean, it's not really an outright that it works for mm -hmm. like colorectal cancer and kidney cancer. But I guess some cells are more susceptible to this. Maybe they express this VEGF receptor a lot more. So there's a lot better. Uh, it kind of inhibits the uh, process of angiogenesis a lot better, but I'm not entirely sure the differences between each cancer because I kind of just focused on eye cancer. Thank you. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm not speechless. Speechless. <laughs> very complex, very interesting. Well done, I think. Okay. <laughs>